I wanted to say, first of all, how glad I am to see some, a lot of young folks here today. And uh, I like that because I got a really great young folk story to tell you. I was a young folk once. Uh, depending on who I talk to, I still am. But um, this, is a, this is something that happened to me when I was 10 years old. When I was 10, my family, my mom and dad, decided we were going to take a trip to go visit our relatives, and so we, we took a trip together. My father grew up in Joplin, Missouri, and my mother grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and so it was going to be a long trip to go visit our relatives. We had a lot of them, and they were all down there. So we had a wonderful trip when I was 10 years old. We got to see a lot of the country, and it was a really exciting trip. And when I was 10 years old, this sounds sort of poetic, I suppose, for a 10-year-old boy. But the thing that I remember the most was the loveliness of the sunset in Laramie, Wyoming. You ever been there, anybody? It's beautiful, isn't it? Rolling hills and the sunset, and there were uh, lots of cultural events going on. And the cool thing about Wyoming... <coughs> was they have buffalo. And I thought the buffalo were fascinating. How many of you kids ever seen buffaloes? Look at you. Oh, some of the adults are... I'm talking to kids. Now, this is me, okay? I think buffaloes are funny looking. They look like they got really well started in the front, but somebody let the job down on the back, right? Okay? But they're big. And here's what happened. As we're driving along, my dad saw a herd of wild buffalo off in the distance, and there was a fenced-off area. So he said, let's get a picture. So he had me stand next to the fence. There I was, 10 years old, and in the background you could see a herd of buffalo, and you could see the rolling hills, and you could see the sky with the clouds rolling by, just perfect Wyoming. And my dad was getting the picture all, I think, I think back in those days it was one of these, okay? And then he, as he's getting me situated, I'm standing right next to the fence, okay? Don't give it away. <laughs> my dad was looking like this, and he looked up at me, and he looked angry. And I thought, what did I do now? And he threw the camera aside, and he came running at me, and he grabbed a hold of me, and I'm going, what did I do? And he knocked me down, and he rolled on the ground next to me, and right then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a buffalo smash right into the fence, right where I was standing, charging right at me. And to this day, you guys, I can remember the sound of the fence. <laughs> and I can remember the snorting of that angry buffalo. And you know what happened after that? My dad scooped me up and we all got in the car and we went to some other spot of Wyoming. <laughs> and he pulled, this is the truth, he pulled off to the side after we went a little ways away and just sat behind the wheel shaking. He saved my life. And when I think of that story, how he yanked me aside, thrust me aside to save my life, I think of what we're going to look at right now in Proverbs chapter 24, verses 11 through 12. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? I want you to look at these, these words. Hope you got your Bible open to Proverbs chapter 24, 11 through 12. Look at how it starts off. Deliver those who are drawn to death. When you look at those words in the original language, the idea is something closer to rescue 
or to snatch away someone, almost in kind of a violent way, grab them to get them out of the way of death. That's what my dad did. And then it goes on to say, and, and it, it says it in a very unusual way in the Hebrew language. It says it something along the way like, oh, that... It, it uses a, a conjunction in the original Hebrew that sounds a little bit like, oh, that, or, oh, I adjure you. I adjure you. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. It's a strong appeal, this verse, this passage. It's talking about something very serious, isn't it? You see someone who's facing danger. Don't stand by. Jump up. Do something. Rescue them. And then it goes on to talk about, in a very remarkable way, our duty with regard to this principle. If you say, surely we did not know this. If someone were to suggest, well, I, I didn't know they were in danger. And yet the implication is, oh, yes, you did. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? In other words, God who sees what goes on in the heart, does he not know doesn't he see it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? He who looks into the very depths of your being and keeps what goes on in your heart, does he not know what you know? He says, and will he not render to each man, in the original Hebrew, it's each Adam, according to his deeds. This is a very serious, serious passage. And you know, the reason I was originally attracted to it was because of Sanctity of Life Sunday. We as followers of Jesus Christ are charged with the responsibility of loving and caring for life. Our God is the creator, the maintainer, and the distributor of life. And he calls you and I to stand for life. When we think about the unborn, I believe, as many have done in the past, this verse has an appropriate thing to say to that. Don't stand by and ignore it. Do what you can to save human life. But as I got into this passage, I started to realize the implications of these words go way, way, way beyond just that alone. When I started thinking about this, I thought of, if you'll permit me kind of a quick review here, I, I thought about how this touches very obviously on our obligation to what I might call a practical application the practical application of saving physical life. I can't think of a better way to say it than that. Practical saving of human life where you can. But there's more. There's also what we might call a judicial application, where if you and I know that someone is being uh, charged with a crime they did not commit, or made guilty of something that they did not do and are destined for judgment because of that. In a judicial sense, you and I have the obligation to speak up and say, wait, I know that this person is innocent. We, we're obliged to say what we know. There's an obligation there as well. There's also an obligation, and again, I'm not sure of the best ways to put this, but a moral obligation. If you and I see somebody heading down a road of death because of their actions, they're making life choices that destine them for eternal, for, for temporal loss and suffering, we have a duty to step in and tell them, don't go down that path. But there's also, again, I think the best way to say it is an evangelistic application. And I think it may be the greatest one of all. You and I know that God has said the wages of sin is death, and the death being spoken of there is eternal death, eternal separation from God. 
And you and I who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ and have been made alive have a moral and responsible duty to declare the path to eternal life to those who are lost. So this passage has a lot to say. And I like to think of it this way. We are accountable to God to pursue the just preservation of life in every sense, whenever we can. That's to be our mindset. Looking to Jesus Christ always. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, he said that the Thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And as his followers, we're duty bound to pursue the life of those around us as much as we can. So this morning, I'd like to just kind of walk with you and share with you the things that I've discovered about this passage And the first thing that I think we need to emphasize is the most obvious one, the practical application. The practical application. As much as we have a responsibility, uh, an ability to do so, we have the duty to preserve the life, the physical life of others, and where we can better that life. The other day I was sitting in the office here, And I was working on this passage, getting things ready, and I looked out the window and I saw a car pull up into the parking lot right here. Not big news. Happens all the time. Woman parked her car right below, right about here, right in the middle of the parking lot, talking on the phone. And I thought, uh, Again, nothing unusual. People pull into the parking lot to talk all the time, so I kept my work going and didn't notice much about it. A few minutes later, I see a emergency vehicle pull up and a fire truck. This person's in trouble. And so I put my stuff down and I ran down to find out what's going on. I felt terrible. I didn't know that she was in some kind of trouble. She was calling for help. And the paramedics were there, and they were helping her. And what this did was it made me grateful for those who are vocationally and uh, responsibly charged with training and with commitment to give their full time to protecting and preserving the physical life of other people. I watched these paramedics as they so gently helped her into, onto a gurney and were helping her inside the emergency vehicle. And uh, after a while I watched and then her husband came and they talked with her husband and so they got her out of the gurney and put her in his car and he was going to drive her to the hospital. I had a chance to talk with her and I asked, well, I am so sorry. I saw you in the window and I didn't realize you were in trouble. And she said, well, I was driving up the windy road here, and I started to get dizzy and disoriented. And I saw a cute little church. What is us? And um, I pulled in, and, and that's when I called for help. But you know, it made me so grateful for those who, that's what they do. That's what they do for a living. We think of police officers. We think of medical personnel. We think of firefighters. We think of military personnel who, by makeup or design, not sure, they they just are naturally bent to protect the lives of other people. They step in. Aren't you grateful for them? Aren't you grateful that we live in a time when there are lots of those kind of people around? I think that may be a rare time in history, and we should be grateful for them. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are responsible also for the lives of others. We're to care for the lives of others and do what we can to protect and and advance that life. There's an Old Testament law. This is really interesting. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 8, there's this really obscure law. 
I'd like to share it with you. Back in those days when people built a house, they made sure to make the roof nice and flat because that roof is a living room. Back in those days, you'd go up there and you'd sit in the sun or you'd eat or you'd talk or you'd play. You'd watch the neighbors. You'd wave at your neighbors on their roof. That'd be nice to do today, wouldn't it? Wave at our neighbors on our roof. What are we all doing up there? I don't know. But that's what they did back then. And here's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof. That's a wall that goes around. That you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. You know what that's telling us? Care about the lives of other people. God and his, his law commanded, pay attention to the safety needs and to the, to the care of other people. Make sure that they are safe and are well and will not fall to their deaths. And brothers and sisters, that just reminds us that we have that responsibility also. I was thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, greater love has no one than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. That's what he did for us. He laid down his physical life. We're to care for the life of the unborn. We're to care for the life of the already been born a long time ago. We're to care for the lives of others. This is our duty. Let me read that passage again. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Care for the lives of others. Now, when I read that passage, you might notice that there is a obligation that it places upon us, which is a kind of remarkable obligation. That if you know of something and you say nothing, you are guilty before God. And this leads us to another application of this, this principle, and I believe it would be best called a judicial application. That's the best name I can come up with. I'm making this up as I go along, folks. But it could be a legal obligation is another way of placing it or stating it. You see, when this book of Proverbs was written, in the ancient Near East, there is a possibility that there was a common principle that was applied in terms of a man or a woman who was charged with a crime and was about to be publicly executed. I found an old commentary that explained it this way. When a criminal was anciently led to execution, a crier went out before. Someone crying out went out before them as they were being led, who proclaimed the crime of which he had been convicted and called upon anyone who could say anything in behalf of the condemned culprit to come forward, in which case he was led back to the tribunal and the case was reheard. The passage contains an implied exhortation to assist the unfortunate one, to succor the distressed and vindicate the cause of the innocent when about to suffer unjust punishment. In other words, somebody had the obligation to say something if they knew that person was innocent. And if they didn't do so, they bore the guilt of bloodshed before God. I just want to call to your remembering Use your good rememberer here. I'll bet you can remember some people in the Bible who could have stopped a, a, a death and didn't. Let me name some people here. Think of Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Do you remember him? When Jesus was shown to be innocent, he even said, I find no fault in this man, but in order to please the the Jewish leaders, he got that pan of water and washed his hands and said, I wash my hands of this, you see to it. And he allowed Jesus 
Now, I'm glad Jesus died for us, aren't you? But he bore guilt. Or you think about Judas. Remember how he cast the 30 coins in front of the Jewish leaders and said, uh, I, I am guilty of innocent blood. I don't want this money anymore. Well, it was too late. Or you think of Saul of Tarsus. Now, we all love Saul of Tarsus. He's, later on, he's called Paul, isn't he? But you remember what he did at one time when Stephen, the noble Christian, the leader, the martyr, was put to death by stoning. Where did they lay their coats? They laid them right in front of Saul of Tarsus, who watched their coats and gave them all the thumbs up, do it. Later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 22, he, he said he confessed to the Lord, I consented to the death of your martyr, Stephen. Or think of Governor Felix. I wonder if anybody's ever going to be named Felix again. I don't know. It's just, well, I do know actually a Felix. But um, Governor Felix, you remember him? He had Paul in prison. And he uh, went to visit Paul and talk with him. And yet when the time came and he knew Paul was innocent, he didn't release him. He kept him in prison, it said, in order to please the Jews. Perhaps the greatest example of all of this would be Cain, who killed his brother Abel. And you remember what he said to God? I think this took a lot of nerve. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, you know what? Yes, he was. He was. You and I are our brothers and sisters' keeper in that respect. Hey, flip it. Think about some people who stood for the lives of others, even at the possible cost of their own. Some real heroes, the Hebrew medwives in the story of Exodus. Remember them? Uh, I, I would have, I'd, I hope we can talk to them one day. They said... Uh, they, they kept the little infant boys of, of the Jewish people alive, even though Pharaoh commanded them to be thrown into the river. And the reason they said, well, we, we can't get to the, those Hebrew women in time. They have their babies so fast. But I wonder if they went like this. Well, it's time to go help the Hebrew women again. They took their time. You know, uh, sorry, I didn't get there in time. You know, they could have died for that. But they rescued their lives. Or you think about Reuben, the, the son of Jacob, who when Joseph was thrown in the pit to be killed by his other brothers, he rescued him. He had to come up with a story in order to do it. I'll come and get him later, but he, uh, he saved his life. Obadiah, you go, Obadiah, never heard of him. Obadiah was a man who lived in the time of the prophet Elijah during the reign of the horrible King Ahab and his, his wife Jezebel. Jezebel was going to slaughter the prophets of God. And Obadiah hid them in caves and fed them from her murderous plot. You think of Daniel. We've been studying the book of Daniel. You remember how Daniel had that dream and the king was going to kill all the pagan wise men, which I think is dumb because you wouldn't have any wise people in your kingdom anymore. But he was going to kill all the wise men. Daniel said, wait, I have the answer to the dream. Stop the killing. He rescued their lives, even though they were jealous of him. Here are some examples, you see, of this whole principle. You and I have an obligation when we know of someone's innocence. Now, we never stand in the way of or impede true justice when justice truly is due. But when we know of the innocence of someone, whether in a small cultural, social way, or whether it's in the big way of sparing someone's life from execution or for from imprisonment, if we know the truth, it's our duty to speak it. Here's what it says in Proverbs 24, 
11 through 12, deliver those who are drawn toward death, hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? This leads us to a third way, and I, I call this a moral application, although as I say, it could be an ethical application. It's the idea that you and I see somebody who's heading down a path of destruction by choices. They make decisions. They make choices to do what God says do not do. The wages of sin is death. It's our duty where we can to say something, to stop them from a, from a choice that will inevitably lead to death. You know, many years ago, uh, many, many years ago, I was, past, I was a youth pastor many years ago. I'm just a pastor now, but I was a youth pastor then. And we used to go on inner tube uh, trips across the Cedar River in Maple Valley, Washington. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was a pretty good sized river and you can kind of float along. And so we got all the kids together and we would float along. Nice, beautiful, calm, s serene thing. There are some spots that are kind of frustrating because you have to actually get up and carry your inner tube over the rocks. Those aren't very fun. But then there are also spots where you got to watch because it starts to get a little rough, but it's a lot of fun. So we got home and I I asked the kids about the trip and what they thought of it. And I said, hey, what, what do you suppose it's like on a river where there's a big, horrible waterfall at the end? What do you think that ride is like? And they all thought the same thing I thought. It's probably kind of nice. It seems like it's a nice little trip, but the end of it is death. And then I shared with them what it says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, which says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Seems so comfortable, seems so good, but when you make the choices to disobey God, when you choose to do what he says not to do, and violate his commandments which were given to us for our good and for our life and for our preservation. It may seem like a nice ride for a while, but the end of it is death. And then I took him to chapter 16, verse 25, and I said, let me show you another verse. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I said, how about that? God wanted you to know it twice. And I wonder if the Apostle Paul was thinking of those very words when he said what he said in Romans chapter 6, verse 20 through 21. It says this, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I have a duty to others around us to say something when we see them taking a course that will inevitably lead to death and loss. We have a duty. We have right here the word of God that tells us the truth about those things. And we're called upon to say something. Now that doesn't mean we will always be successful, does it? We can't stop people physically from their choices unless they are under our direct responsibility. But we can warn them and we have a duty to warn them. There's an amazing thing that's said at the end of the book of James. Let me read this to you. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Here's our duty, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a moral duty. When we see someone heading down the road of death, do not be silent. 
Do what you can to appeal to them. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? And let me end with one more application. And in my mind, this is the most important one of all. This is the one that covers them all, really. We have a duty to save the physical life of someone where we can. We have a duty judicially to save them when they are innocent from judgment. We have a duty to rescue them from moral decisions that will end in death. But the greatest death of all is the death of being eternally separated from Almighty God and being subject to his just wrath for sin. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I who have placed our faith in Jesus and have experienced redemption and the forgiveness of our sins have a duty to tell those who are lost and still subject to the wrath of God, the message of eternal life, to turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. When I was a very young man, I still remember it, I memorized John chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. I'm looking it up now because I'm not a young man anymore. <laughs> this is kind of a funny thing. I remember reciting this to myself as I'm riding my bicycle around SeaTac Airport. For some reason, that just comes to mind. This is the testimony, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. This is the testimony. Boy, there's a solidity to that, isn't there? Something strong. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And here it is. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Don't you love it that the Bible puts it clearly? And you and I have a responsibility to tell people of him who is the way, the truth, and the life, who died upon a cross for our sins and bore our guilt before God so that we can be clean before him when we put our trust and put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. It's the greatest call to defend life that there is. You and I, brothers and sisters, are on the greatest rescue mission of all to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And if you know this, and I know this, and we don't do it, what guilt we bear. Let me read to you a very frightening passage. It's Ezekiel chapter 33. I don't like reading it. Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 11. Let these words impact you. God speaking, again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning shall save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away, it takes any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way. That wicked man shall surely die in his iniquity. 
but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus, uh, thus you, you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And what this does is it places this great responsibility on you and me. Deliver those who are drawn toward death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? As you can see, this passage is a big one. It goes all the way from, I mean, just <laughs> rescuing a kid from a buffalo to declaring the message that saves the soul. And when you and I read this and we really look into it, I wonder if you're like me. I'm guilty. I bear a guilty silence upon me. God help me. But what I believe we should do is look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the forgiver of our sins and who is the greatest rescuer of all. When we confess where we've fallen short, he forgives us. Where we have not protected, defended, declared, directed, or sought the salvation of life for others. He forgives us, but then he empowers us. Let's, let's pray together right now and ask God to help us to be the people he wants us to be in this. Heavenly Father, this has made us uncomfortable. This has made me uncomfortable. But you have entrusted to us a great charge. And Father, the reality of our hearts causes us to confess that we have fallen very short from the responsibility that we bear as your people. Forgive us. But by your Holy Spirit, let the life of Jesus Christ, the great rescuer, be lived in and through us. Open our eyes to the needs of those around us in all of these dimensions, and most importantly, in the dimension of giving forth the word of eternal life to others. Would you help us to be courageous in these times? Help us not to be afraid of being ridiculed for declaring a message that's offensive. Give us courage and give us strength. And give us words and give us a heart of compassion. Help us, Father, to be used by you to save the lives of others in Jesus' name. May we truly, truly sanctify human life in all its dimensions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.